The James Bond books and movies, and the many more to follow in that genre, made the world of international spies and subterfuge seem exceedingly glamorous. But is it as exciting as it is made out to be in fiction and films? I'm Jill de Villiers. With me today is Jonathan Anser, whose latest book is entitled Betrayal, The Secret Lives of Apartheid Spies. Welcome, Jonathan, and thanks very much for coming in and chatting to us about your book. Thanks very much, Jill. <laughs> thanks for having me. So let's jump straight into it. Um, Betrayal, the title of the book. And th this is one of the themes that you carry through. The other one is uh, forgiveness. And, and what is the other word? Uh, repentance. Repentance and forgiveness. Um, how many of these people do you think actually repented their actions? It's difficult to say. Um, the, the book sort of follows a, a book that I wrote about Craig Williamson, who was regarded as apartheid's super spy. Um, and following that, I was quite interested to see uh, what had happened to all these other apartheid spies. Um, and so I went on a quest to, tr to try to track them down and to speak to them and to ask them if, if, if they were repentant and to find out what they thought uh, 25 years after the curtain has come down on, on apartheid. Um, most of them downplay what they did, the seriousness of their actions. Two of them, um, I felt, really grappled with what they had done. Um, not all of the spies in the book were working for the apartheid government. Some were, were actually working for the liberation movement. Um, and I think there's a difference between spying for the apartheid government and spying against the apartheid government. But I, I think specifically two of those spies, a woman called Joy Harden, who um, had left Rhodes in 1985 and had been recruited into Special Branch and uh, had then infiltrated some of the left-wing organizations in Johannesburg. Um, she's, she really has grappled with, with what she had done, the, the sort of life of deception, betraying people. Um, and then the, the author, Mark Baer, he also grappled uh, with what he had done. He had infiltrated Stellenbosch campus. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, he unmasked himself, the only spy who actually confessed to being a spy, who, who wasn't unmasked. Mm -hmm. Now, in the chapter you write about him, there are some people who say that it, it was more expedient for him to do it, that he wasn't really feeling bad. What do you think? You know, w w before I even started writing the book, I'd been, uh, I've got a friend of mine who was at university with Mark, and was very bitter about what Mark had done. And um, so when I started doing the research, this was at the, at the back of my mind, that Mark wasn't actually sincere. And actually I changed my mind about it, even though I'd come in, in with those ideas that Mark uh, had been, um, it, it had been expedient of him. He, he, he had just, he, you know, he, he was at the stage of his career where he had just won all sorts of awards for his book, uh, The Smell of Apples. Um, he was delivering a keynote address, and I think he realized that he was going to be unmasked at some point. Mm -hmm. And so he decided to, 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 mm -hmm. to do it himself. But, you know, subsequently reading what he, he then made a submission to the, the Truth uh, Commission, although the Truth Commission didn't call him as a witness and his submission went nowhere, mm -hmm. but I read his submission. And, he, and I read, uh, and I spoke to a lot of people that he went and apologized, and I think they got quite sick of him apologizing. Um, and I, I, I could really sense his anguish. And I, I, you know, so I, I, I turned full circle. I, I, I became to believe that he was genuine, he was authentic. Um, I mean, I, I do quote some of the people mm -hmm. that, that still are quite angry with him. Even he, he died, um, he had an untimely sort of death. Um, and he's the only person who's, who, who, uh, that I profile who actually has died. Um, the others I, I try to track down and speak to. Oh, then you come up, we, we'll talk about how many people you spoke to as well, but you get to the personality of the person who goes in for this, who decides to to become a spy and to betray yes. other people. Do they actually know at the time what kind of betrayal they will be committing towards their friends? Um, I think they do know. I think all of the people in the book, 
I, I made a choice to spy. And that's why I decided to profile th these particular spies, because they all, I believe, they went in with open eyes. Not all of them, you know, some of them were manipulated, and I, I, I do try and explain how they came to be spies. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think they all made choices to go down that road of deception. I think they went in, you know, it, it's very interesting because uh, uh, Craig Williamson, for example, he doesn't believe that he betrayed these people because for him, he never belonged to them. So it, it wasn't a, a sense of betrayal because, you know, in order to betray them, you have to belong to them and then betray them. Oh. And so he, f he was playing a game. Oh. And yet by infiltrating, you bring yourself close to those people, they believe that you are one of them. Yes. And then you stand aside and say, well, like he did, stand aside and say, but I wasn't part of it. I was, yeah, I was mm -hmm. never, I, I was doing a job and your job description is to betray. <laughs> 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 so there's also the um, Olivia Forsyth. I think she was the one who actually phoned and said, I want to be a spy. That's right. Tell me about her story. Yes. So, so um, she had studied at WITS. Um, then she was working um, for the Department of Foreign Affairs and then she felt that she wanted more excitement in her life and she contacted Craig Williamson. He had already been unmasked at, at that point and she said to him, you know, I want to come and be recruited. And they brought her in and they gave her all sorts of tests and they decided to recruit her. Um, she went off to Rhodes University and, and this is very interesting because she really, of all the people, she became part of, of a close-knit group of students, of friends, of comrades. She lived with them, she went out with them, she socialized with them, and she sent people to prison. Um, she passed on information that had terrible consequences. And then how it gets very, very interesting, she, she wrote a book about, uh, a memoir about her, her, her time as a spy, and she claims that she actually became a double agent, that she was persuaded by the anti-apartheid movement and decided to defect to the ANC. And so I went and I tried to kind of investigate whether this was true. And uh, I don't think it was true. And I speak to people who contradict some of the claims that she made in her book. And I think, I I in a way, she was always working for the special mm. branch. So I think the message in that chapter is she maybe thought that she was working as a double agent? I think or, she, knew. she knew. She knew she was I think wasn't. she knew. I think okay. it, was, it was a game that got so complicated uh -huh. that it may be at times she forgot who's, which side she was working on. Uh -huh. uh, but ultimately she was always working for herself. Um, she, she's, I believe she's quite a manipulative person. I think to be a spy you uh -huh. have to manipulate. That, that's the other part of the job uh -huh. description. Uh -huh. um, and I think uh, uh, um, she was always trying to be one step ahead of everybody and in the end became yeah. kind of, you know, had actually quite a terrible experience being arrested by the ANC, then escaping, uh, coming back to Special Branch and having quite a, a, a traumatic life. Oh. So I can't remember exactly who uh, in the book now, but um, somebody, you did mention somebody who um, thought um, that what the information that they gave wasn't that much and couldn't do that much harm. Um, who was that? Okay. Uh, in fact, it was a number of them. Oh, okay. It, it was a common thread. Okay. Olivia said that. Mm -hmm. uh, Joy Harden said that. Mm -hmm. Even uh, Mark Bear said that. Uh -huh. um, Gordon Brookbank said that. They felt that, well, they were just passing on information. Uh, even, even Vanessa Brereton mm -hmm. said that. Uh, the, the, the passing information that was fairly harmless, mm -hmm. but actually, what was happening is, is, is the special branch and th there were a number of agencies, a uh, boss, uh, and, and they were an taking all this information, they were sort of analyzing it and they were coming up with a bigger picture. So if uh, they had three or four different uh, 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 bits of information mm -hmm. about a certain activist, then they would know that this person was connected, who they were connected oh. to. And so th putting all this information together was like putting a big puzzle sure. together. Mm -hmm. So they might have believed that they were, the information they're passing on was quite innocuous, but actually it wasn't. Oh. Oh. It had tremendous consequences. Oh. So I think one of the, the, the most uh, impressive um, 
stories is the one of Vanessa, who was a lawyer who defended people. She was a human rights, rights lawyer. lawyer. Yes. And, and how that betrayed, that betrayal is really dreadful. I think so, because, you know, she was taking on clients and she could see what was happening. You know, she, she was act, uh, acting or involved uh, in, in the mid-1980s in the Eastern Cape. And that was the height of repression. And it was the place of repression. The, the special branch in the Eastern Cape in the 80s were, you know, notorious for the, the, the terrible things that they did, the brutality mm -hmm. and the repression. And she, she had come in um, to represent people whose human rights had been trampled on, who had been tortured, who had been detained for long periods of time, and she was pretending to be acting in their interests. And as a lawyer, she was acting against them. And, and I think that's, that's a special kind of betrayal. Um, I think lawyers especially have a, 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 a trust relationship with their clients. I, I think they are the only people who's, who have the sense of privilege. Journalists don't get privilege, uh, uh, priests don't have privilege, but attorneys and, and lawyers and advocates, they have privilege. Um, and she betrayed that. And I, for me, she was kind of a special type of, uh, you know, a, a, a extreme betrayal. Oh. Jonathan, unfortunately we've come to the end of our time. I just want to mention that we've just touched on what is in the book. So our viewers will have to go and buy the book to read all the stories. And it's really worth a read. It is a very fascinating book with very fascinating stories. My guest is Jonathan Anser and his book is Betrayal, The Secret Lives of Apartheid Spies.